Good morning. Good morning. I am here today with Representative Karen Beyer, who represented the 131st Legislative District. Right. And that included the counties of Lehigh and Northampton, and she served the years 2005 and is presently serving in 2010. Right. Thank you for being here with me today. Welcome. I wanted to begin by asking you about your childhood and your family life and how you feel that prepared you for public service. Well, I'm one of 11 children. I was born in the western part of the state in a little town in Westmoreland County called Manor. It had actually a great political tradition because my father served on borough council there with a former state legislator and state senator's father, Alan Kukovich. And so I'm one of 11, and um, I think that in and of itself prepares you uh, for a lot in life when you're number nine out of 11, and I'm the youngest daughter. so. I learned compromise and I learned working with both sides um, early on, but uh, my first foray into politics was working on Alan Kukovich's um, first re-election campaign in, in 1979. So that was my first foray, but my father was involved in politics, so it seemed pretty natural that I would be. I, I seemed to, my whole life kind of followed my father. I am my father's daughter, no doubt. So how did you choose the Republican Party for yourself? Um, well, that was actually a relatively easy choice, especially at the time that I was in. I, my father was a Democrat, and I came out of a long line of, of Democrats, um, my father being born and raised in Scotland. Um, a working class, he was a steel worker. He was actually college educated, but he was a steel worker, um, a union guy. Um, but uh, I went into the military when I was um, 18 years old, and at that time, President Reagan had had just taken office in, in early 1981, and um, so that was an easy choice because I, I suppose, in, in many ways, I was a child of the Reagan era, growing up. So he was kind of someone I role modeled and I liked very much. Well, you talked about your um, experience is in the the Air Force. Right. What else did you do before coming to the Pennsylvania House of Representatives? Well, I was. Uh, I went in the military when I was 18 and I served for four years and I, I found my husband in the military. He happened to be a fighter pilot. I was an enlisted troop, he was an officer. And I met him during the end of my enlistment. So after I uh, finished my enlistment, we got married. Then I served as a military spouse and went to college. We were stationed all different kinds of places, um, Florida and Ohio. We ultimately got stationed in Virginia in the first few years of our marriage, and I ended up going to William and Mary um, for a government degree. Actually, it was more of a pre-law degree. And then um, I entered in the world of journalism. It actually started in um, uh, Ohio when I worked at a television station, but it continued when I was at William and Mary, and I did a lot of writing. Then I went overseas, and my husband and I were stationed after I graduated from William and Mary in Tokyo, Japan. So I did some newsletter writing and just kind of reporting to the um, troops in, in uh, Japan uh, while we were stationed there for a few years and then came back and worked at a newspaper in Virginia and my husband was stationed at the Pentagon. He ultimately retired and uh, I ended up really, my first foray into hardcore newspaper writing was at the Patriot News in, in Harrisburg here and um, then the morning call in the Lehigh Valley. I, my husband became an airline pilot so we got stationed or we got assigned uh, to the New York airports and decided to move to the Lehigh Valley and I started working for the morning call there. So a few years in journalism Yeah, and I reported on local municipalities, um, did a lot of feature writing, and then ended up working in corporate communications in the morning call, but um, really learned a lot about people and found myself wanting to tell people's stories. And I think in some ways, it's not a big stretch between you know, running for office, especially a, a state office like representative and being a journalist, because you end up wanting to champion people's causes and so it wasn't foreign to me at all to kind of get in there and get into issues and so that's what I did. Really I was a journalist. So what made you decide to run for the Pennsylvania House of Representatives? Well I didn't really. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I uh, 
was working at the morning call and was really doing quite well and my husband was doing quite well and and my children were growing up and and um, I made a decision to kind of leave working and I, I wanted to kind of devote myself to volunteer work and spend a lot more time with my children and it was at that time that I was asked to run for school board as part of a slate of candidates so my first foray into politics was just serving on a school board and we got elected five of us ran out of nine members and we all got elected we won resoundingly and then I um, became board president so I tried to um, muscle through a budget that first year without a tax increase and it ultimately ended up having a tax increase but I ended up being the board president that voted against it and they, you know during that time too the the uh, in prior administrations the board was accused of and of financial improprieties and in fact when I first took office we were notified of a special investigation by the Auditor General's office and so that first year was a year of kind of investigating the financial matters of the district and finding that there had been a lot of um, kind of unseemly improper um, compensation to the superintendent and things so we cooperated with the Auditor General, got rid of the superintendent and um, really kind of set the district on the right financial course and I think as a result of that it was in the paper a lot and there was a lot of headlines related to what was happening with this extraordinarily wealthy school district and how funds were misappropriated. Um, and then I was asked to run for state representative as a, as a result. And, and why that was is um, Charlie Dent was a senator who was running for Congress and got elected. Um, Pat Brown was the, uh, was the uh, House member and he was running for Senate and so I was asked to help Pat with the Senate campaign. You know I should say too I re-entered um, working uh, by um, helping uh, Representative Doug Reikley as a legislative aide in his district office. And I, was only, I was his only full-time staff member and then I, you know, I was a school board director and a, a district aide and um, it was out of that experience I think I was asked to run for Pat's um, seat. So I won it, ran in a special election and was elected July 19th of 2005. And what was that like for you? Well, it was really something. It was a 90-day whirlwind of activity. I knocked on over 7,000 doors in 90 days. Um, I liked being in pretty good shape. I mean, uh, it was hot, and um, I walked thousands and thousands of miles and um, knocked on people's doors and asked them for their vote. And, and you know, really got motivated uh, by so many issues that were really on people's minds at that time, property tax relief and there had been a midnight pay raise uh, vote here in the house so people were disconnected from state government feeling alienated from it feeling that state government was um, corrupt and um, that gambling was also passed right before I took office so there was a lot of reasons to kind of run and because people really felt that that most of the legislative work was being done when most people were asleep and that's actually had proved to be true and so when I first got here, I, I ran on a platform that I wouldn't uh, participate in that. And in fact, I refused the, the pay raise that was, um, I was urged to take. I refused and then worked um, early in my early days in the legislature trying to set forth reforms so that government was more transparent to people. And we stopped having, you know, 4 o'clock in the morning sessions and stopped at 11 o'clock at night and trying to do things more in the light of day instead of uh, behind the scenes. So it was an interesting time to come to office. It was, it was qu quite turbulent, it was a tough time. Was the campaign a tough campaign? The campaign was a tough campaign, yes, because it was, I had a very formidable candidate, a woman who had served as a tax collector in one of my largest municipalities for the better part of 25 years. So she was elected to that office and uh, was quite well, well known. And so it was a very tough and tight race. She was very competent, very good candidate. And I have to say, I, I missed, that, missed that kind of running that kind of campaign because it was really on the issues. It really wasn't a campaign of personal attack. And, and I think things have changed since then. But then it was, it was definitely a, a fight for ideas, people's hearts and minds. It was, it was a lot of fun. She was a good candidate. Could you talk a little bit about, you, you were sworn in 
in August 2nd of 2005. Were you by yourself? Being I was by myself and um, John Prezell was speaker and um, you know a number of members came to the ceremony and the people that I didn't really know and it was great. I had my family on the floor and we brought a busload of people in that had volunteered on the campaign and, and it was quite it was quite fun. But John John was speaker at the time and he was he was just really tremendous. Really good guy. Did you like to campaign? I did. I I, I did. I grew to I think I like most elected officials, you grow to not like certain aspects of it. I hated the the fundraising side of it. I hated the amount of money that it took. Um, you know, I was elected in August or uh, July and sworn in August 2nd, but I turned around and ran again just a few months later um, in a primary. I didn't have a primary opponent, but my the woman who ran against me um, the first time, Linda Minger, she ran again the second time. So we spent, I think, between those two elections about very close to two million dollars. It was quite expensive. It was it was a lot of hard work. Is that normal for that district? No. no, I think I think at that time they had been two of the most expensive races on record. I, I'm sure it's been beaten since then, but at that time it was quite a bit of money. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't realize how much it. It, it was it, between us. It was a lot of money. We were on television and radio, and yeah. I think I sent 13 mailers the first time I ran. It was quite expensive. Could you describe your legislative district? Uh, the, basically the issues, the geography, the people? Yeah, the legislative district is one of the 12 bellwether districts um, in the state. And what I mean by that is it is an accurate predictor of what's to come. Um, it has accurately predicted the past eight um, presidential and statewide elections. Um, so, so, so as the 131st goes, so goes the rest of the state. And why that is is I'm the only urban Republican member um, in the Lehigh Valley. So about 40% of my vote sat in the city of Allentown. So I, I covered um, the south and east part of Allentown. And um, then I have a very um, wealthy, upscale, um, upper middle class area. And then I have a rural and farming community as well. So I have a little bit of everything in the district. Um, it is a democratically registered district by about 15 points. So, uh, you know, for a Republican to hold this seat is, it was always difficult just by registration. And then to have a district that you have a little bit of everything, it's, it can be somewhat challenging. You can't be a one-note legislator, I don't think, in this district. You really have to, uh, you have different constituencies for different reasons, and I think that it's important to kind of be an ear for all of it. It's hard, though. It's a challenging district. What were some of the issues of each of these groups that you talked about? Well, truthfully, I centered, you know, my energy on the urban side of the district. Um, you know, Allentown is the third largest city in the state, so Allentown requires um, much more attention. And uh, it is a high tax base, uh, mostly low income. Uh, about 70% of all the children who attend uh, school the public schools in Allentown are on free or reduced lunch. About 50% of those children are English as a second language. So when you have that, um, you have quite a challenge. And crime has been increasing every year in the city of Allentown, so I, I focused a lot of my energies and attention on the city, uh, build a coalition, uh, certainly build a working partnership with my Democrat colleague, uh, Jennifer Mann, who has the majority of the city, and we work together for through economic development projects, more funding for the school district, just try to find innovative ways where we could be helpful to the city and really try to turn it around. It's a city in decline, as most urban areas are, and Allentown hasn't really seen the bottom yet. And so what we were trying to do is essentially save it uh, from happening, or at least doing our part. And um, I think we made some major inroads. We're not finished yet, um, but it, it, it became the center of my attention. You know, an upper middle class area, 
um, most folks don't really need any help and don't really access government very much. And then the rural community probably became my second priority where we had sewage project failures. Um, we have farming communities, so farming subsidies, uh, farm research, all of that is really important. So I concentrated on the urban area and then secondarily on the agricultural area. Do you think that there's anything that made your district unique? Um, other than it being a bell. Right, other than it being a bellwether bell district. district. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I think I think, I think what made it unique was the was the makeup. It had been so heavily gerrymandered over the past couple redistrictings that um, it was difficult. For example, when I first took the district, it had just a slight Democrat voter advantage, but because we've had we're on the I-78 corridor, we've had a lot of. Um, immigrants, for the lack of a better word, from, um, or emigres from um, New Jersey and New York. So it started to change, um, and that's why, you know, the registration at 5133 looks like it does now, because we've gotten a lot of kind of imports from other states. So I think what makes the district unique is that it has this very um, Pennsylvania Dutch base of farmers you know, people of the land, um, even their accent still puzzles me sometimes, but you have these kind of salt of the earth people. And then you have this huge influx of urban, cosmopolitan kind of upscale people. And, and, and then you have an urban challenge of an extraordinarily high Latino population. Um, and so it, it's a challenge in that, um, it's just very different no matter what neighborhood you're driving in. I'd like to talk a little bit about camaraderie in the house mm -hmm. and um, maybe even prior to you coming to the house, it sounds right. like you had already started developing relationships with house members. Right. So um, do you think that anyone served as a mentor to you and have you been able to mentor others? Um, I think I think I had some mentors, I suppose. Um, I mostly looked to my committee chairman you know, it was tough coming in in the special election because I didn't come in with any class, um, didn't come in with other freshmen, I came in alone. And so it became really difficult to kind of figure it out and maneuver. And you had to be really kind of quick on your feet. Um, there was no, there was kind of trial by error. And um, I think that posed a challenge. And so I did rely on, on my colleagues, but I had to get to know them first. I mean, Representative Reichley, I think, initially was helpful because I had worked for him, and so I knew him well. And I knew most of the Lehigh Valley delegation. And then Senator Pat Brown was extraordinarily helpful and served as a mentor to me even to this day. Um, but I looked to my committee chairman, like John Taylor, when he was chairman of Urban Affairs, and, um, and I looked to others, um, my leadership. I looked to Sam Smith a lot, um, Stan Saylor, Mike Terzai. So, I think I accessed everyone and tried to, you know, utilize whatever knowledge they had. Were you able to develop any strong friendships with um, House members? Well, I did, um, a number of them, but one in particular, well, there's a couple, but um, Sue Cornell was a representative down in Montgomery County, and um, Sue sat behind me on the House floor, so here I come in the first day of session, plop myself down in my seat. She happens to be sitting behind me. We strike up a conversation. I'm watching her and Tom Quigley laughing like crazy. They sat next to each other, and we're always joking around, reading the Urban Dictionary mostly. But um, um, and I had never heard of it before, <laughs> so um, I sat down and and uh, just started chatting with them. And then Sue and I became like really quick, fast friends, and ultimately became roommates in a in a townhouse that we rented together, and uh, we're, we're still very close, uh, best friends to this day, but it started there in, uh, in August of 2005 um, when I got to know her and Tom Quigley, and then, um, of course, it branched out immediately to um, Jeff Powell, out, who's a representative out of Armstrong County, um, who's like uh, probably one of my closest friends to this day. and. Uh, the three of us were kind of, or four of us really, were like the four musketeers. I guess I joined in. They were the three musketeers. And then we had folks like Brian Ellis and 
Um, I mean, Will Gabig, who I sat near on the I sat close to on the House floor during my entire tenure. Um, these are people that are just really close to me and I know really well and have a lot of fun with and and uh, you know have a drink or two with. It, it's just been really great. Uh, they're wonderful people, really, all of them. And Sue, very similar to me, lost in a primary um, in her reelection effort, and so it was kind of it was sad to see Sue go and then. And then ultimately, uh, I lost some two years later. So it was, it was uh, three years later. So it was difficult, I think, for her to kind of watch that happen to me after it happened to her. So the relationships you've built, they'll continue, I'm sure. Oh, I, I think so. I, I can't imagine them not. Uh, I don't know that I'll end up in Harrisburg, but um, yeah, I think that you know, you once you serve in that chamber, you know, it is like a brother and a sisterhood and. And I think that you really do ultimately care deeply for each other, but it is definitely not limited to, to party because one of, one of my closest friends, Jennifer Mann, um, I'm extraordinarily close to Mike O'Brien out of Philadelphia. He's, we have dinners on, on Sundays sometimes when we're both out here. So, um, yeah, it's definitely a great uh, friendship. You would never know um, from what the rhetoric, the political rhetoric, or even the debate on the House floor, how much respect I think we all have for one another. It doesn't seem to be in fashion to, to suggest that you work across the aisle or you care about someone on the other side of the aisle, but nothing really could be further from the truth. Um, perhaps some of the camaraderie has been lost since I first got here. It seemed much more uh, there was a lot more congeniality, I think, when I first arrived in 2005 compared to today. Um, it's a very, there's a very destructive kind of vein in politics now, so you don't see it, um, you don't see it as obvious as it was when I first got here. Everyone, you know, with shook hands and, you know, you'd see people talking and laughing with each other. I'm not sure that that's necessarily the time property tax. Do you know what may have caused that change? Um, I think it has to do with um, the polarization of the two parties in general nationally and you know make no mistake about it that's certainly transmitted to the state and local level. I think there's a great deal of mistrust and I also think it's motivated by power it, you know um, when one party gets in power I, I think they tend to forget about you know the kind of importance of representing all of the people instead of just what your your ideologues of what your party wants. Um, and it's what's missing in public discourse today, I think, is this idea of working across the aisle. In fact, even in my primary loss, I think that was one of the big, um, the big strikes against me, at least in my own Republican primary, is that I worked with the governor and I worked with the other side of the aisle, and in fact, that was prominently used on campaign mailers against me. So. Um, I think when you can defeat someone in your own party based on the fact that they reach across the aisle and work, on, and work with other members, um, that, that doesn't bode well, I think, for ultimately really good policy coming out of government. I think you're going to see in this next year a real struggle for some people that want to work together and some who absolutely do not. So it's, it's, it's a shame. You had mentioned that you had worked at, in the newspaper business. Right. And do you feel, having been a political person, do you feel that you were rightfully portrayed or incorrectly portrayed in any way? In the way? newspapers, in the media? Yeah. I always felt really good about um, how the media portrayed me. They didn't always portray me favorably, but they always portrayed me honestly. Um, and I, you know, I have a great deal of admiration for journalists in general, especially newspaper journalists, but it's not limited to that. Um, and because uh, I, I mean, I really think Pete Tocorsi's great and he's all online. Um, and I worked with Pete at the Morning Call years ago, but um, I have a great deal of respect for them. They are the truth sayers. Um, they are the last um, glimmer of hope we have, I think. And it's, and it's dying, unfortunately, newspapers of really kind of conveying to people what is what is what are the actual facts without any kind of bias and it, and I think in that sense that we should not let our newspapers die we should look at subsidizing them because 
in the media today and online, there's no kind of ethical commitment to the truth the way there is, um, has been a longstanding tradition, especially in newspapers. And when you have this kind of blogging environment where pretty much anybody can anonymously say anything they want without retribution, um, then you have a problem. And I think that what's going to happen is there's a conveyance of misinformation to people. And that's, that's too bad because that's not what journalism is supposed to be about. It is about telling the story and telling the truth. And there's really no obligation online anymore for that. So I worry about it. But I never thought I was mis mischaracterized or misportrayed. I didn't always like what they said or I didn't always like the picture they used, but I think at the end of the day I'm pretty proud of of what journalists have done for Pennsylvania. And, the, and even when they disagreed with me I always felt it was respectful. So, Okay. Um, I'd like to move on to your committees yeah. and, and your committee work. Uh, did you have a favorite committee that you worked on? Um, no, not really. I liked everything. I. Um, I think that there was something that happened, maybe a, a light bulb or a switch somewhere in my head, um, where I really loved the idea of legislation and kind of improving, um, improving legislation or improving upon what was already there. So. I think it started with education. You know, I was assigned to the education committee when I first got here, and that seemed logical because I was a school board director, and you know, it would seem logical that I'd get on. So I get on to education, and I immediately start seeing ways that we can improve kind of the way we're funding education, the way we're spending money. So I looked forward to that and started introducing a whole slew of legislation related to that, cyber charter schools and how to hold them accountable and <clears throat> and then I sat on um, Game and Fish which I enjoyed um, but it was short-lived because that tends to be kind of a junior committee and you know then the following election I moved up quite a bit in seniority so um, I really enjoyed Veterans Affairs and Emergency Preparedness because I was the only female veteran ever elected in the history of the House of Representatives that served on active duty. So for me, you know, veterans issues were very important as a veteran myself. And I really enjoyed working with the Adjutant General. There were a couple of times when we passionately disagreed with each other. I think the one failure of Pennsylvania state government is that they don't serve veterans and don't serve them well, as well as they could and um, they don't spend enough resources to assist veterans. And as we move forward with Af Iraq and Afghanistan, there's not nearly the resources that should be spent on veterans in Pennsylvania. So I tried to be a voice for the veteran um, at the state level. And, you know, I think to my frustration on that committee, as much as I liked um, the members, we really couldn't get done what I thought needed to be done to help veterans and uh, that was to establish a separate cabinet Department of Veterans Affairs and pull it away from Pima and pull it away from the control of the adjutant general as much as I liked her um, and respected her I thought that she had a conflict where she was really marshalling the resources of current Guard and Reserve members she couldn't possibly um, with the same um, level of resources and commitment catered to the veterans who, you know, go all the way back World, World War II, Korean, Vietnam. And what we find is in Pennsylvania, um, veterans' dollars are not um, uh, dispensed with in Pennsylvania at, at the level they should be. For example, Pennsylvania is the fifth largest state with a number of population of veterans, yet in terms of dollars spent from the federal government per veteran, Pennsylvania is somewhere near the bottom of the 50 state list because we don't really have a consolidated strong effort by the executive branch to access those dollars that the federal government gives in support of veterans. Fl states like Florida and Texas who are competitive with us on the number of veterans get billions of dollars more a year from the federal government for their veterans. And it's a problem in Pennsylvania, but 
um, because of the different veterans constituencies with whom some I agreed, some I did not, I was not able to marshal through a, uh, a plan to help veterans in the way that I thought they should have been. So it was a good committee in that I learned a lot, but in some respects it was a very frustrating committee. Um, I don't think we're, by the way, prepared in emergency management wise either the way that we should. It certainly doesn't. Um, we certainly spend hundreds of millions of dollars for emergency preparedness, but we still, for example, to this day, um, after spending billions of dollars on it, do not have a radio s emergency radio system where PennDOT and the state police can talk to all of the local municipalities and the county emergency management departments. I mean, that, it's just an outrage that we've spent what we've spent and it hasn't gotten completed. So there are some issues, but I'm hopeful that at some point the legislature will decide that this is a priority given the massive gas exploration that we're undertaking in the state of Masala Shale. So that was a good committee. I liked liquor too. I liked liquor a lot because the Liquor Control Committee because I liked I like tend to like the way the system is. And they were doing a lot of innovative things, wine kiosks, we were putting beer into grocery stores, um, trying to make it more consumer friendly. Um, and it, it is a valuable resource to the state. It brings in about $400 million a year into the state budget. So that was a fun committee. And then I'm a recent to consumer affairs, which I love. We deal with, deal with the public utilities and things and, and uh, commerce where we deal with banking and credit. So I, I've enjoyed all of them. I've probably been a little bit, a little bit long-winded, but there are so many things that I think still need to be done that um, maybe as a departing, retiring legislator, I'm just a little bit regretful that some things didn't get done. You had mentioned um, the seniority system. You yes. kind of just hinted on that. How do you feel about that? I hate the seniority system. Um, you know, you would otherwise like it. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, you would expect that someone serves a long time, that they have a great deal of experience, and then they're able to kind of um, move that forward. The problem is the seniority system in Pennsylvania, legislatures use to block most of the time legislation, not to initiate it. And just because someone's been here a long time doesn't mean that they know everything. In fact, it might surprise you and it certainly surprised me, that there were some members um, on both sides of the aisle that um, are quite ineffective and quite lazy and um, don't do their job. And um, I think I was disappointed at times when I witnessed that. Um, I think also, too, when you're here a long time, you become kind of, you can be easily become corrupted by the system that put you here. And your only concern then is reelection, and not necessarily you, you don't become a risk taker. And I think part of leadership is risk taking. And I think it, on some members that's lost. So it's, it, it doesn't work in my mind. It doesn't work in the way that you would think it should. And I, I always found that pretty disappointing. But then there are some other longstanding members that are fearless. It's just not all of them are. So that's, that's kind of a shame. Um, I'm not sure if you'd like to talk a little bit about that. Um, you had mentioned- I'm not gonna name any names. Gonna, no, <laughs> I, I won't ask you to name names. Okay. But you had said that um, whenever you were sworn in that John Prezell yes. was speaker. Right. And there's been all kinds of things going on right. with him right now. Yeah. And what kind of leader would was you- Was John Prezell? Would you say he was? So I got here in 2005 and the Republicans were in charge. And um, we were m movers and shakers. Now, understand it was in the wake of the pay raise and the um, gambling, the uh, legalization of gambling. So the public, I think at large, was pretty upset. Probably less about gambling and more about the pay raise. And that's a, that was a shame, that something that should have never been done. Um, 
I can say unequivocally that the pay raise does not sit at the feet of just John Present. Know everything. I know that it was uh, several majority Republican committee chairmen that demanded a pay raise and demanded that um, the speaker support that. And that if he didn't, they were he was told that he would uh, be removed from office in the next election cycle right, in terms of being speaker. So uh, John, from what I understand, and it comes from very reliable sources, championed that um, pay raise. When the governor um, and others and the Senate leadership um, were able to get on board, they were fulfilling then the pay raises of their constituencies. I think Governor Rendell, mostly the judges, the Senate, of course, their own membership. But when I got here, I got here post right after that vote in July took place. So. I made a promise to my constituents when I was running for office that I would refuse the pay raise, which I did, which was easy enough to do. And then I worked to Mers and Shakers, which we did, and I think it was of the pay raise. John Brazell was always uh, very polite and very kind to me. Um, I only spoke to him one time when I was campaigning, and he called me on my cell phone from his cell phone um, to congratulate me on knocking on my 5,000th door. And um, so I appreciated that. Then the only other time that um, Speaker Purzell ever offered me any advice was after I was sworn in. He invited me to his office and I sat down and he said, Karen, I, I'll never ask you for a vote. And the only thing I want you to do is vote your district. Vote exactly what you'll be removed from off. And don't ever feel compelled to do anything, to vote any other way. Um, and I think that when he told me that, I was very relieved that he told me that. But I think I really took it heart because I think ultimately my primary defeat uh, resulted in the fact that I didn't toe the line for my own caucus. I, I felt right after that vote, I could vote to, for what I believed was the right thing to do or vote exactly what I thought my constituent do, and then I worked to. And, it, and I think that I always held that advice by John Purzell close to heart, vote your district. And he did. He never asked me for anything. No, and myself never asked me for a single vote on a single issue ever. And he, when I, for example, I, one of my first um, votes was that we had a, a group of procedural votes for the increasing of the minimum wage, a promise then I made to my constituents, son, and he said, collected. And um, we had a bunch of procedural votes, and I voted against my own caucus, who was voting no on the increase in the minimum wage. I was voting yes, and I voted every procedural vote, and then ultimately for the bill, yes. And John Prezel, but I think I really took bias on the rostrum, and um, he never once ever asked me to, to vote any other way even though I was the only green light on my side of the aisle on a lot of advice. I was never questioned and I was never told to do anything other than what I felt was right. So when you have a leader like that, um, and that's how I know John Purzell, um, I was always really appreciative of that. Of course, as you know, things changed that following year and um, John Purzell was removed as speaker, even though the Republicans, um, or the Democrats, were in the majority, I suppose they had maybe by one or two seats, and Denny O'Brien became the speaker. Um, then, then things did change for me. But during that period of time, it wasn't like that at all. Hmm. Thanks for sharing that. I'd like to talk about your legislation. Right. You had one bill that um, passed. It was House Bill 2001, and um, it was on anti-price gouging. Yeah, I had four bills signed into law, not one. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're going. We're going to get. <laughs> but during that, oh, that was during that period mm -hmm. of time? Oh, yeah. Um, well, that was House, uh, Speaker Purzell. Um, we had a, uh, we had Hurricane Katrina, actually, and um, it came out of that. Um, I had gotten some, um, information from my constituents that the price of drywall, batteries, flashlights, 
and all of, all of the, and gas, gas was a big problem. Um, was, you know, I mean, sometimes you'd ride down the street and, the, you know, gas would change by a dollar a gallon, um, increased by a dollar a gallon in just one day. But it was on all the other things, too, batteries, flashlights, uh, drywall. Here in the Lehigh, I mean, just here in Pennsylvania. So I went to, um, I went to Sam Smith at the time, and I said, I really want to do this bill on price gouging in the event of a natural disaster that essentially um, uh, stores and uh, can't increase. So I went to, uh, just because there happens to be a natural disaster in the other part of the country, and we found evidence of it. And in fact, the Attorney General was investigating a lot of instances related to gas prices, gasoline prices. So we uh, formulated the legislation. I worked real disaster in the other part. Found evidence of it. And in fact, experience with a staffer that I thought was um, superior. And it's probably my first, one of the finest uh, staffers uh, here. Um, extraordinarily accommodating, very knowledgeable, um, very helpful. I worked with some energy companies, um, worked with um, some consumer protection folks, and we ultimately, the governor's office, we ultimately came up with a really good bill. And But for the speaker at the time, who really thought it was an important piece of legislation, if he didn't feel that way, it, I doubt that it would have happened, but he did. He thought it was an important piece of legislation. He knew that I worked really hard on it. And then he saw, he saw fit to make sure that that got past the House. And then I think it got through the Senate probably by the good graces of folks like Pat Brown and others who really wanted to see this legislation go through. So it was pretty exciting. It was a major piece of legislation for a freshman. So I was pretty happy. I'm proud of it. So. And it's been successful. It has. It has. I mean, I think that um, the instances, I mean, there's been other natural disasters since then, not any quite as bad as Katrina, but certainly others. And, and we're not, you know, they, I'm sure that um, stores and others, uh, outlets, whatever, are selling products that think twice about um, raising prices just for the, you know, sheer ability to be able to do it. So. And you wanted to talk about your other pieces of legislation? I have three became? other bills signed into law. All of them, the three others are related. I had four bills total in five years, which is, which is actually really good um, legislatively. Um, there's a lot of members that have been here for over a decade and don't have a single bill signed into law, so I feel pretty lucky. But I was, I was always kind of a squeaky wheel, I think, in my caucus. Um, you know, I always. Uh, you know, made sure that my leadership knew that when something was important to me, because I felt that if I didn't tell them, they may, they may never know. I didn't expect them to just, you know, know about me versus anyone else. Um, but the three others just got signed into law this year. Um, I've had them for a couple of years, and they came out of um, an idea by my brother, who's a, a county detective for the district attorney in Westmoreland County. And they're related to impersonation of a police officer. Um, in Philadelphia and in Pittsburgh, um, prior to my bills being signed into law, uh, if you impersonated a police officer, the most you would get is a summary offense and a $100 fine, even if it was in commission with another crime. Um, the rest of the state, however, has it as a third degree misdemeanor punishable five years in prison and I think $5,000 fine. So what we did is we, because there was, there were incidents on the west, western part of the state where a guy had painted his car black and white and was pulling women over. Now he wasn't victimizing them, he was pulling them over, but it was believed by law enforcement that he was doing it as like trial runs to see if he could get up the muster, the courage, and the ability, and then ultimately victimize the women that he was pulling over. And the, the most he got, it was near Pittsburgh, or I think it was in the city of Pittsburgh, the most he got was a $100 fine. Not all of them are $100 fine. So what we did is we increased the penalties on that. But it took three bills to do it. Two of the bills are repealers. We had to go way back into the statutes 
some hundred years and repeal what was in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia to make the laws uniform across the state. And then the third bill makes the law uniform across the state. So it was a three bill package that ultimately got signed in the law. And, it, and they were inspired by my brother. But, you know, it's not surprising because pretty much all of the legislation that I ever did came from my constituents. It, you know, I just figured out a way to do it, but most of the really great ideas came from them. So, mm -hmm. for most of the bill, I think I introduced over 45 or 50 bills since I've been here. I, I did want to talk about a couple other pieces of legislation that, sure. you, did, that you did introduce. And you did uh, say that it was, this was probably a constituent of you, yours, Heidi Marcos, yeah. sister, the Robbins hmm. Law Bill. The, yeah, Violent Offender Registry. Yeah. Um, Heidi Markow is um, not a constituent, actually, but she lives in the Lehigh Valley. Um, I don't know if she'd maybe seen me on television or maybe heard about me or whatever, but came to see me to tell me a story, and it happened a number of years ago, where her sister had married a man um, who ultimately killed her and then held the police, and he was domestically violent. Um, her sister hid it, um, didn't tell anyone. They didn't find out till later. Uh, he beat her frequently and things, and isolated her, but ultimately he decided to kill her. And then he was in a standoff with police for like four or five hours, and ultimately he was killed by the police. Um, I think he attempted to fire on them. The details of the story are pretty sad, um, but Heidi, her sister Robin, was the victim. And Heidi came to me to say, look, we went back into my sister's husband's past and found out he had tried to kill, to, tried to kill a previous wife with an ax, or a previous girlfriend with an ax, and was charged. And if my sister had known about his previous domestic violence incidents, we might have been able to have saved her life or she might not have ever hooked up with him. And like, um, like Megan's law where uh, child predators have to register, you know, maybe we should have a domestic violence registry where people who have been convicted of domestic violence incidents actually be posted whether it's against their own children, spouse, girlfriend, live-in. Well, I like that idea, and it's, especially if they've had like PFAs issued against them. I liked that idea a lot, but I wanted to go one step further. In Pennsylvania, if someone has been convicted of manslaughter, for example, unless you go to the county where they were convicted, you'll never know that. So I decided to create a, the, the violent offender res. Uh, uh, registry. That is any offense um, that was violent in nature, like manslaughter, murder, all of it. And um, I really feel passionately about it and I still think it's a good idea. I mean, especially in this information age where we have most records online anyway. And frankly, I don't really care and I'm not sensitive to anyone who's been convicted of that level of crime. It's a matter of public record public resources were used, um, were used in the prosecution of the case, um, and my feeling is the taxpayers have a right to know, um, but residents have a right to know. And, you know, some might argue, I suppose, on the civil liberty side of things that, well, they've, they've done the time, they deserve to be, you know, be able to move on with their life, but um, I also think that there's more than likely a victim and the victim hasn't been able to move on uh, or, or has had difficulty moving on. But at the end of the day, if you set out to commit a crime, there are more consequences than just serving time. There are others, and these, this could be one of them. Was never able to get it off the ground because um, the Attorney General and the Governor's Office felt that there was not the money for it. Although I believe it's minimal amount of money. Um, but I'm hoping in the next session that someone picks up the ball and, and tries to move that forward because I think that would, 
would do a lot to protect women and children, although men are victims too, it would certainly help to protect women and children from the potential of a, especially when you have this online dating thing now. You know, you have Match.com and people are meeting online where you know even less about the person than you might have known, say, you know, five or ten years ago, where you actually went on a date and met them face to face, even if it was a blind date the first time. But now, people are getting to know each other in a whole new way, and oftentimes it's very anonymous. I can sit on the other end of a computer in another state and tell you that I'm a svelte, uh, six-foot-tall um, Polish model. And you wouldn't know any different until you saw me in person. And I, so I think in that way, this adds an extra layer of protection and another way for people to find out information about each other that they may want to know. Mm -hmm. Cyber school funding and, <laughs> and regulations were big issues for you as well. Right, right. Would you like to discuss the problems inherent in the rise of cyber schools and how you think that they may impact uh, the Cyber charter schools. schools, oh boy. Um, so, cyber charters, um, they fail. Um, they're inadequate. Um, perhaps a new way to educate children, but I think lack the standards and the accountability necessary. Um, the way they work, and in some cases they do work, it has, only with the parent fully engaged in the education process of their child. Then they work and can work quite well. And I can also see how cyber education could kick open the door of what we call kind of traditional education by a child being able to go online and uh, take Chinese 5, which would never be offered in a public school because the resources aren't there. So they could, this is called distance learning too, in some ways. And so it could really make education innovative. However, what I found in my investigation of cyber charter schools is that most of them fail. Uh, most of the students are failing. Better than 50% uh, are failing. I've had over a dozen whistleblower cyber charter school teachers that tell me that the schools that they're working in, one middle school math teacher in particular down in southeast Pennsylvania has over 500 students. And he said more than 50% of his children are failing and more than 50% he can't keep track of because there's no way for him to know whether the child is signed online or not. One child uh, in the uh, western part of the state was signed up for cyber charter school and ultimately was convicted of killing her father because her father signed her up for cyber education so that he could molest her all day long. And no one accounted for this child. There was no, once she went to a cyber charter school, there was no accounting for truancy. There was no accounting for her whereabouts. Um, so it can be disastrous. Um, in some instances. But I said, like I said, if you have a parent that's fully engaged and totally watching their child every day as an extension of, say, homeschooling, then I think it could work. But the results are in and the testing is done and most of the cyber charter schools aren't meeting annual yearly progress. And I have to say, that any public school where better than 50% of the kids are failing or unaccounted for would have closed. But in Pennsylvania, we allow for this. And what I tried to do with this bill was make them accountable. We had a truancy aspect in the bill. We had a money aspect in the bill. It costs far less to educate a child via cyber charter than it does a traditional bricks and mortar school or even a traditional bricks and mortar charter school, far less. But yet they spend the same. 
and cyber charter schools receive the same amount of money that any typical traditional bricks and mortar charter school gets, 80% of what a school district spends per child per year. So I'll give you an example. At Socket Valley, where I was board president, we spent about 16, when I was board president, we spent about $16,000 per child per year. In Allentown, when I first took over as representative, Allentown was spending about $8,000 per child per year. So you could tell the difference in the wealth. Allentown's spending much more than that now because we got them a lot more state funding. But having said that, if a child signs up for a cyber charter school in Saucon Valley, they're going to get 80%. The cyber charter school is going to get 80% of that 16000 And if a child from Allentown School District signs up for the cyber charter, they'll get 80% of whatever the 8000 that Allentown is spending. So there's incentive for cyber charter schools to really attract the wealthier school district kids. But because it's so inexpensive, and they offer the children a free computer and they advertise on the radio and television and it's completely 100 percent taxpayer funded there's no private money here it's all taxpayer money and they advertise and give away free equipment it's attractive for parents to sign their children up for this especially if they're having problems in school or if the parent is dissatisfied with the school itself so I tried to just put some accountability measures in place. And um, I mean, we don't even require criminal background checks on the teachers who teach children in cyber charter school. Now, there's a lot of online stuff going on. But Republicans were adamantly opposed to the bill, and some Democrats. And um, the bill failed to really get anywhere. And that was unfortunate. It's a good bill. Is anyone looking at this issue today? I don't know if Mike Fleck is going to take the bill next year, um, who is, by the way, a really good guy and a friend of mine. I'm very proud of him. And uh, I'm worried about him, frankly. I think part of my defeat in my primary was that I took on um, the cyber charter schools and and they all ultimately paid me back um, so they didn't really see the merits in what I was trying to do because I, I felt that if they complied with these accountability measures we would make them better than what they are but um, Mike is going to take the bill and I I'm you know I have some concerns about him so I hope he I hope he's ultimately okay that they don't come after him but it looks like he's taking the bill okay that was a tough long there's so many issues long involved. drawn out battle um no I, I told you the more kind of mm -hmm. sensational aspects but i tell you them because we're outraged every time we have a problem in a public school we hear a teacher acted inappropriately with a child and it happens absolutely um or we have like i ran a school district where funds were misappropriated prior to my arrival I mean, all of those things are outrages. KDKA did a series of ongoing investigative reports on a cyber charter school in the western part of the state where they took 80-some people to a spa for a week in Arizona on the taxpayer's dime. Or they were paying, we were using taxpayer money to fund cyber education for children in other states. And I couldn't get it where it needed to be, and I spent years negotiating that bill with the Auditor General's office, the Attorney General, the Governor, but I couldn't get it out of the House of Representatives. Dwight Evans saw fit to block it, and that was it. Hmm. it was, it's a shame. I think it's my one failure. It's probably why I have the demeanor of having a sore spot, because I wish I'd been able to do something about it, and I tried, but I failed at that. Are there any other pieces of legislation you'd oh. like to, 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 Excuse me. to talk about? I have a cold, so for the record, if we can't ever edit this out, 
I have a little bit of a cold. Um, probably, um, oh gosh, there's so many, but uh, one that comes immediately to mind is a spoofing bill that I have that came from a state policeman um, that lives in my district that's in the computer fraud division of the state police where spoofing is that you have a program where you call people and if they have a caller ID you can literally say that you're, in, you're the White House calling or you can say you're a bank calling and the intention is is that you spoof the caller ID so then people will divulge personal information and it's been used in scam after scam after scam after scam and I have that bill that, that's the short way of describing it and I've had that bill and I'm really looking forward to making sure that that bill goes through um, next session and I think it will because law enforcement really wants it so I'm it's a bill that I want to give a special gift to and I and I and I would like Pat Brown Senator Pat Brown to take it and and do it because I think it's really important and it comes out of the Lehigh Valley but um, I mean here we go I have so many elderly people in my district that have been victimized by somebody faking like they're their bank I'm calling you from Lafayette Ambassador Bank. Can you give me your social security number? Can you give me your birth date? You... And then ultimately access to their bank accounts. I've had some um, ripped off of tens of thousands of dollars. And, that, and that's why I talk so much to my elderly folks about don't tell anybody anything about yourself ever. Don't even answer the phone. So I, I really want that one to go through. So you're passing on your pieces of legislation to... I am right now. Um, I am, actually. I'm looking at it and making a decision of who to give it to and who I think might be worth, mm -hmm. who I think might think it's worth right. pursuing. I'm sure some things they may not think that, but, mm -hmm. I, you know, I think most of my... Leg it's all over the place. I mean, I have legislation just about in every area, so... Well, whenever you you said that you're responding to the needs of your constituents, right. I'm sure with well, the, with the interesting area you, you one of eleven, it's easy to be all over the place. I think yeah, sometimes. Well, what do you think the hardest issue you encountered as a representative was? Being a woman. I think being a woman is hard um, in a man's world. Um, well. Maybe being a woman, the kind of woman I am, which is um, to say that I don't suffer fools gladly and um, that um, I, I'm just not a yes person. And I think that, you know, oftentimes women are, uh, women who are assertive and strong um, are, are, you know, talked about in a way that is very derogatory. You know, I can be bitchy, um, but if a man does exactly the same thing that I might do or say, um, aren't they ambitious? Aren't they self-assured? So I still think that being a woman is tough in this business, and um, I think that was probably the biggest downfall. I think if I would not have been defeated in a primary, nor would the right wing of my party come after me if I was a guy. I just don't think it would have happened. I think that they would have, you know, if anything, I think that, that the right wing of my party would have, if I was a guy and they didn't like what I was doing, they would have called me in and offered me the courtesy of, you know, showing their concern. But that didn't happen. I. Uh, I was kind of blindsided by it, and I, and I think that that shows you the weakness of a woman, and that is that we aren't always anticipating that there's someone around the corner that's after us. We, we tend to, we have a tendency, I think, as women, and I don't mean to generalize too much, but I think that we tend to think the best in people, and we have a tendency to um, 
be more doers than talkers and we have a tendency to be much less Machiavellian, I think. And uh, I don't have a lot of Machiavellian, Machiavellian tendencies. But guys are raised very differently, and I think that they see the world very differently. But it's still definitely a man's world, and I don't know that that's going to change. I mean, I think even if you just look at how Hillary Clinton was, um, depicted and you know to be fair to her um, this is an extraordinarily capable and confident woman and and yeah the adjectives to describe her were always very personal in nature and I don't I think that that at the end of the day for women to really succeed is there has to be many more of them elected. When I first got here, it was probably, oh, I don't know, maybe six months or so into it, I remember turning around to Sue and saying, we should start a women's caucus. I mean, I'd really love to get to know the women on the other side of the aisle. And maybe we could come together on issues that matter to us, like breast cancer research or issues related to choice or life or domestic violence or child support are all different kinds of issues that women that tend to come up in most women's lives and Sue thought it was a great idea and believe it or not at that time we had no women's caucus now we have firemen's caucus we have a cigar caucus we have a veterans caucus which I started by the way and um, um, we have an uh, Alzheimer's caucus and we have a life caucus and we had no women's caucus. So I went to E.Z. Taylor who is the majority caucus chair at the time and I said, E.Z. I'd really like to start a women's caucus. And she said, oh you mean for Republican women? And I said, no, a bipartisan women's caucus. And Easy hated me from that day forward. She told me that I had no business even thinking about that and that I surely shouldn't include, even to think about it was bad, but then to include Democrat women was even worse. And that I should, um, I should uh, be proud that I got here on my own merits and that women should never want to separate themselves from men and their interests. So that women's caucus, um, and then I, I, I just remember being so insulted by the conversation and, and, and I'll be honest with you, she's really the only member that I can think of that I disliked from the first conversation to the end um, because I felt so um, demeaned and insulted and what made it worse was prior to me coming here I had learned a lot about Easy and I respected her from afar. Now maybe you know Easy was old much older and you know in declining health at that time and so I, I suppose in the subsequent years after her departure I attributed her uh, lack of sanity to um, her age and maybe she was just tired of it all but I remember thinking that it was one of the worst encounters because it was the first time, well it wasn't the first time, but it was such a glaringly obvious that women are oftentimes their own worst enemies. And that was the experience that I drew from that and I resented it. And we ultimately started a women's caucus. Um, 
very enthusiastic representative, Karen Bobak, like me, when she got here, she wanted to start one. And she came up to me and said about starting a women's caucus, and EZ was gone by then. And I remember smiling to myself, and I said, Karen, I just think it's a great idea, and I'll come to the meetings, and I look forward to it. But the women in the House of Representatives are doing themselves a great disservice because they're not doing it, not because women don't want to know each other and don't want to relate to each other on issues. They're not doing it because of strict party strict party lines and they're not doing it because it's not encouraged by the male leadership at all. Because if you got, just think about it for a minute, all the women united on one issue, that's a voting block. And no man in charge, and they're all men in charge, no man in charge is going to want to deal with that. They're not going to want to deal with the 30 plus voting block of members who could control the legislative agenda. Not that that would be your goal, but that's what their ultimate fear is. So it didn't happen. I'm not telling you a very good story about the chamber, but... No. Well, that question has come up quite a bit historically. Really? About the uh, Pennsylvania House of Representatives Women's Caucus. and. It's good to know that there is one. Well, there's, here's, that's the truth on it. And, and um, yeah, I, I just remember Easy hated me after that. I mean, really, literally, like, she'd give me such a hard time on, on issues. Like, I'd be sitting in caucus and somebody would be whispering to me and it, it, say it would be me and Jeff Pyle and me and Jeff would get yelled at. I mean, it was just like, it was weird. It was the most bizarre thing. <laughs> Excuse me. It was the most bizarre thing. Well, what aspect of your job as a legislator did you enjoy the most? Um, I, w I definitely would say the people, you know, the people I met and the people I served. And, and um, there wasn't a single person that came into my office. I didn't care how big their issue was. It was going to get fixed. Um, we saved houses from foreclosure. We've... Um, gotten people health care, uh, we've gotten them free prescription drugs, um, we've gotten them homes to live in, we've gotten their children placed in schools that was appropriate for them. Um, we've solved so many different problems. I just, I refuse to allow anybody that came into my office to not, not be served in one way or the other. And I, I don't think we ultimately got a reputation because I ended up, I think, at the height of my, my being in office, up until uh, prior to the primary of this year, I think we, were, we had an average of 20 cases from other districts a week. So we got a reputation of working really hard. And I, I'm not saying this to, you know, kind of pat myself on the back. I mean, after all, I lost an election. So, but I was very, you know, uh, convinced that you you know, work hard with people. Um, I also am really proud of the fact that I had 26 legislative meetings with my constituents, town meetings, in the five years that I've been, a, you know, almost six years I've been a member. And those, you know, meetings were really well attended. They were attended by, you know, more than um, 120 each. Some of my meetings were 150 and, and you know, we really were able to talk one-on-one -on -one, like grown-ups uh, back and forth about what was happening in Harrisburg, why were there certain votes taken that they were. So I, and I used, instead of mailing newsletters, I tended to do that where I would buy them a meal and talk with them because I wanted to kind of hear what they were thinking and I wanted them to react. Like, I, um, the only vote I regret ever casting was um, the vote that I, I uh, cast banning gay marriage and the constitutional ban on gay marriage in, in Pennsylvania. I, um, not that I'm supportive necessarily of gay marriage, but one, it's an issue I'd like the state not to be involved in, and two, if there are, a, you know, I think it's appropriate for civil unions or some sort of acknowledgement. Um, 
but I voted against, uh, I voted for the constitutional ban on gay marriage. And I did it at a time um, when um, I didn't feel, it was early in my career and I didn't feel confident that the people I had earned the trust and respect of the people I represented. You know, that doesn't just come. That is something that's earned over a period of time. And I felt like my constituents didn't know me well enough and that I was taking a large risk. And so I resented the fact that the bill was brought and I stood in caucus and I begged my caucus leadership not to bring the bill for a vote. I have a gay brother and another gay family member and I love them very much. And they're in stable, loving relationships. And I think that when you have uh, gay family members, you're sensitive to it in a very different way. And um, I lost that battle in caucus. So I had, I, all the representatives of gay, of homosexual, transgender, and gay groups had come to my office, and there were several of them. And um, I think that because they thought I had already kind of set up to be an independent thinker and voter in the House, that they thought that they might have me vote with them. And I told them what my dilemma was, that I didn't feel that I had the confidence and trust of the people I represented yet, that I was too new, and that if I voted against the ban, that I was taking a, a risk to have someone run against me and I feared that I wouldn't be able to help anyone then if I was defeated. And they were crying in my office, all of them, and uh, the vote came and I, I compromised that vote. I, I, I went against what I thought I I, what, what I wanted to do. And I voted for the ban and never got anywhere. I left the House and went to the Senate and never got anywhere, and not that I mean to be emotional, but um, I swore that I would never do that again, that um, I didn't follow you know, my heart, so mm -hmm. that I mean be emotional. But. No. Well, whenever it hits you, yeah. So close to Well, that, that's, you, when you know you did, you did something wrong, that you went against your own principles, I suppose. When you know that, um, and you, you can think of the exact moment you did it, I think that anybody with a conscience, you know, you, you feel bad about it. And I think that is something that I feel bad about. But fortunately, um, it never went anywhere. Um, but I, you know, I, and I promised them too. I remember saying, look, I can't do this vote. I don't feel confident. I don't feel strong enough. But I'll, I'll do a bill for you. I mean, I, I will be there for you on another issue. And sure enough, another issue came. And it was um, fair housing and, um, like any discrimination in the workplace. And I ultimately ended up being a co-sponsor on that bill. And then my good friend, Senator Pat Brown, was the prime sponsor in the Senate. And, um, you know, in Pennsylvania today, that bill's not going on, gone anywhere, by the way, but in Pennsylvania today, if you have a child, convicted child molester living next door, and say you're in an apartment building and rents an apartment, there is no requirement by the realtor to disclose to you that there is a predator in the building. However, under current Pennsylvania law, if you have a homosexual couple that lives in the building, 
The realtor is allowed to disclose that. Hmm. So that was the foundation of the anti-discrimination um, bill that I signed on to. And um, you know, I was happy to do it. But you, you know, I can honestly point um, to that as the only time I ever made a politically calculated decision based on my concern for re-election was that one time and it still stands out for me so oh sorry that's all right you ever get that ever have a member cry yeah mm. yeah good then I won't be alone no not at all okay well what aspect of your job <coughs> do you enjoy the least <sighs> What I enjoy the least, um, boy, I just described a couple of them. Why yeah. am I doing that? Because um, it's actually been a really positive, wonderful, crazy, life-changing experience. Um, I described them. I mean, I, I hated uh, raising money. I hated uh, lobbyist control in Harrisburg. Um, I hated, I tell you what I hated personally was back home, feeling, feeling like because I did, I voted so differently than, uh, not on a lot, of, on some occasions, but not a lot. I was actually with my caucus a lot more than I wasn't, but how every time I wasn't with my caucus, how you know, I would vote with the Democrats for one reason or another. I was a pro-environmentally endorsed, pro-labor endorsed Republican. So I was always a little bit different than my Republican colony, colleagues in, in the Lehigh Valley. And um, I hated explaining it to donors, to people who control the political process, which is lobbyists and donors. You know, at the end of the day, it's always about running for re-election. And, uh, you know, as a House member, it never stops. And for me, if you include primaries, I ran eight times in four and a half years. I mean, it's like ridiculous. And uh, with my special election and all. And um, I, I hated it because it was driven by money it was driven by me asking for money. And, um, you know, I had to literally say, if you're giving me money, you're not getting your agenda with it. And, and I think that is exactly what happened to me in this primary is this old man who absolutely hated me because some rich old guy who, uh, because I, wouldn't follow what he told me to do in terms of votes, ultimately funded my opposition. So, you know, it came back to bite me. You know, I, I suppose that I could have done what my colleagues do, which is wink and nod and never vote um, in a way that bothers him. And um, I refuse to do that. So, you know, it's, you, when you do that, you run at your own peril, which is, why ultimately I take full responsibility for my loss because I just couldn't do it. I, I just couldn't do it. I mean, but maybe it's because I thought this wasn't the end all be all for me, that re being a representative was great, but I didn't see it as the pinnacle of my life or my career. You know, I've, I've, I've done a lot prior to coming here and I expect I'll do a lot after, but for some people, this is it. They're going to, they're going to retire. They're going to retire with the big pension, and this is the best that they could have ever hoped for. And I just, I just never saw it that way. And I think at the end of the day, that's why I was willing to take more risks, maybe. But I don't know. Maybe people, people just believe their own rhetoric. I don't know. That could be the case too. I, I can't believe it. But um, you know, I mean, you know, we've got now a legislature that's committed to not taxing more sale of shale, and I'm going to say they're out of their mind. I mean, that's like nuts. I can't even believe that anyone would be even supportive of that. I, I think that anybody that would, it, you know, they shouldn't be sitting in that General Assembly if they're not willing to put up a vote 
for an industry that is destroying our state and take, taking a natural resource. They don't pay corporate net income taxes because they're not based in Pennsylvania. So they pay no extraction tax. So they're essentially taking a natural resource and paying us back nothing, nothing in return. And it's, that is generational theft. And, um, but you know, I, people get elected, I guess, on that agenda. I don't get it, but you know, hopefully things will change and turn around, who knows. Well, I'd like to ask you about your fondest memory. Ah, oh, I have so many. Um, okay, well, this is just one of them, so don't limit it to this, but it's more of a social thing. Um, so Sue Cornell and I rent this beautiful little um, townhouse, and it's right across the street, right across um, 3rd Street on, on, on a street called South Street. And um, it, it's like a duplex. So we have one half of the duplex, and you know, it's just one of those typical old townhouses where it has uh, hardwood floors and um, a wrought iron bathtub, which, you know, as a girl, you would appreciate, because I did. And uh, um, it has a balcony. And we have. Um, I reflex right next door, but I have no idea who they are, you know. I mean, Sue and I are in our own little world, you know. I drink red wine, she drinks white, and we'd come to session, and then at night, after we were done with the long day here, we'd get back and have a glass of wine and talk and all night long, and just had such so much fun. Until one day, well, we were having fun, but we, we go home, and then we're coming back for session, and it's winter time. I think it was a signy die session. And um, there's this bald headed guy. I don't know, maybe he was shoveling my sidewalk on my side. And, you know, it's definitely, I mean, definitely not Sue. She, doesn't, she didn't know anyone bald headed, I'm sure. But she would never, like, <laughs> shovel the sidewalks. So, you know, this bald headed guy is, like, shoveling my sidewalk. So I get. I pull my car in front so I can unload it of all my luggage and everything. Sue wasn't there yet. And I look over and I said, hi, how are you? And um, I said, thank tax. you so much. So like, shoveling my sidewalk, like, who are you? And <laughs> here it's Todd Aegis. It's the majority leader, but he wasn't the majority leader at that time. And he said, I am Todd Aegis and I live next door. And um, I have like, you know, and I said, oh, oh, so you're a member. Like, you know, I didn't, we, we were really, you know, it was like a few months after we moved in and I really hadn't been a member that long. I was just barely getting to know the Republican members, let alone the Democrat members. And, and I, so he must have known, since I came in alone, easier for me to, to know one than me to know 202. So, you know, I shake his hand. I thank him so much, you know, and, you know, and I, it frankly felt like a lot safer that I had Todd Aegis and you know his roommates you know it's just one of those typical well I would see them on the house floor hi you know how are you and every Monday when I came to session during through that winter sidewalk shoveled I knew it was Todd <laughs> so we get to the spring late spring and we're all become real friendly and hang out and stuff. And I went to Todd and I said, I think we should have a budget bash. I think we should just have this big party, rope off the street, and let's just invite everybody. And, you know, we're going to be here for budget negotiations. It's going to be a long one, you know. It was our first budget, my first budget. And uh, everybody, you know, the stories, we were getting nowhere. All the reports in the newspaper were that it was going to be a long, protracted budget fight, and it was. And um, Todd says, that sounds great. So we get Jeff Powell. So the Republican committee is Sue Cornell, excuse me, Jeff Pyle and me. And on the Democrat planning committee was Todd Aegis, Flo, and um, oh, Jesse, Jesse White. There was a bunch of them. I think they're all. 
So we handle the Republican side. They have to, but me and Todd were the point people. And wouldn't you know, we rope off the street. We have beer. We have food. We even have a DJ. And we, you know, that evening we all get together, bipartisan. I mean, it's, you know, everybody. And the, some of the lobbyists come. And, but most importantly, some of the young staffers come and the staff that, you know, session during, down here and things and members galore. Let me just put it this way. The first year we had the budget bash, it was about 400 people. So we turn around and we do it again the following year. That turns into about 800 people. We stopped having them <laughs> because they got so big. And, but I think at the end of the day, what it kind of showed you and what I really wanted to have happen is that, you know, we all just not forget, you know, we all have the same mission. Like we all are supposed to do the same thing, which is defend the interests of the people. We don't always have to agree on every issue, which we shouldn't. But at the end of the day, we should be friends and we should care about each other because that's ultimately the message that we want to kind of send. So I suppose, I mean, I have lots of fond memories, don't get me wrong. Well, too many to count. But if I could think of the two things that I thought, it ended a few years ago, by the way. So I think it's been, it was three years ago that we did that and then the year before that, um, it, it tells you that kind of state of the way people are interacting. Because when we did that, it was fully embraced and everybody participated. And in fact, it was the talk of the town. And I even think some of the media guys showed up. I mean, it was just like everyone was just, it wasn't a drunken brawl party. It was just, it was beautiful weather. And it was just a place for us all to hang out for a little while. We certainly didn't buy enough alcohol to, to have anybody get drunk. But it was just a way for us to kind of have a street party and come together and take a break from the insanity that sometimes happens here when you're in a difficult thing. Then we did it again the following year, but it hasn't been done since. And I, and I think that that tells you kind of the state of how people are relating to each other. And part of it is that people are angry with each other, even here in this capital, and don't like each other, and, and you know, you don't have the esprit de corps that you wanted. But it also tells you how uncomfortable people are, that there really has been a litany of um, kind of attacks on the legislature and the integrity of it and the character of it. And I think it comes from Governor Lech Corbett when he talks about how corrupt the legislature is and that, and, and uh, he certainly believes he's found evidence of it. I, I'm not going to judge. I, I wasn't part of the jury. I could tell you I wasn't part of it. And I know many, many members who weren't part of it, of what is, what is even alleged, let alone what his, some have been convicted on together. Time around this place when people really did genuinely like each other. And I'm not sure that's the case now. But maybe, maybe it'll change. That's probably my fondest, well, one of them. I mean, I met like people like Gary Sinise, and I met um, Terrell uh, Pryor, and I met, um, I mean, I met Pittsburgh Steelers and Pittsburgh Penguins, which I'm a big Pittsburgh fan, and I've met Eagles, and I met, you know, I've gone to some great games and things. So, I mean, I, I mean, there's just, and the people here are really tremendous. A lot of the really great staff that go totally unacknowledged that, that should be. So I was long-winded there, sorry. No, that's fine. <laughs> How would you like your tenure as state representative to be remembered? Well, I think I said it in my goodbye, goodbye remarks, which I think we're going to give you a copy of for the, for the record. I suppose I want to be remembered as, as a person who worked across the aisle. I, I, I was defeated on that notion, but I, I don't care. It's still something that I'm really proud of, that I, I I cared more about people than party. Um, but I suppose uh, I want people to remember me as like it was one of a mission, you know, that I tried to do my best, that it wasn't about ideology, I don't like it, um, um, that I was humble, 
I was a humble servant that I didn't act like I knew more than I did. So I just, I, I hope people think it was honorable and decent mm -hmm. that, that I cared. Mm -hmm. So Would you have any advice for new members? Um, don't go to dinner with lobbyists. I stopped seeing them in my office like two years ago. Um, get, get rid of, don't, just, you know, in a perfect world, I'd like to, I'd like maybe new members to not get taken in by the, you know, going to go buy you an expensive dinner and, and, um, and, uh, you know, influence how you vote. Um, office like two years ago. I wouldn't get caught in that trap. Um, my advice to these new members is most of you ran on a platform of reform, calling the incumbents um, corrupt. You said the system was corrupt. You're not going to accept per diems and pension and um, cars. My strong advice to you is that you keep it. You keep your word, what you ran on, and um, um, care about the people you represent because um, this is all fleeting and you know I, I knew when I came here that I would just be a grain in the sand of you know what the whole entire house that's that was set before me of people that did far more than I could have ever hoped to have achieved and and uh, you know you'll be a you'll be a distant memory it doesn't it doesn't really take that long so do your best while you're here care about the people you represent do you have future plans? I do. Um, I, I'm not going to talk about them right now because <laughs> they're still care about the people you represent. I've been, you know, I have a couple things in the works here in Harrisburg. Um, my desire, though, is more to go private sector for now, and so I have a couple of irons in the fire in private sector, or I'm going to throw coming back to Harrisburg and private sector completely over the over the side, and I'm going to start my own nonprofit. Um, and I think, in that regard, I, that's where my passion is and the fire in my belly. I have some things that I want to do, and um, I'm blessed with having a very uh, accomplished husband. And and so, you know, income is not as important as it may be to some others. And so. You know, maybe I have the luxury of being doing something meaningful, and I think what I fear is that if I go corporate or I come back to Harrisburg, that I'm not gonna. I'm doing it more for the paycheck and going through the motions, and not because I really care about something. And I think that you know, God put me in this time in this place to do something, and so maybe I should just allow that to happen. And I think in that regard, more than likely, I think I'm going to start a nonprofit and advocate on behalf of people in one particular interest, although I'm not at liberty to tell you what that is yet. <laughs> so. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. It was a very nice interview. And Great. Um, Thanks. I didn't mean to be emotional that <laughs> It's hard. I'm still a girl. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, you know, you give something your heart. And so, well, best of luck to you. Thanks. Thank you.